Hi guys, uh, my name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist. Today I wanted to do a video on a um, medication that I think can help some patients with POTS but is not, as, is not prescribed commonly, um, but I was keen to talk to you about it. So uh, let's get started. Um, the first thing to say is that medical care for patients who have a diagnosis of POTS is hugely unsatisfactory. Okay, POTS or rather dysautonomia is a very heterogeneous condition. No two people are exactly the same. There is no one single causative etiology. Uh, often the patient who is uh, really, really suffering from within looks all right from the outside and therefore people don't believe that this person is suffering. Uh, many doctors, largely out of ignorance, but also perhaps arrogance, uh, don't believe in the condition. Uh, many don't know enough about it to start treatment. The problem also is that research in this hugely debilitating condition is only being uh, driven by a handful of centers, a handful of enthusiastic institutions. And they have limited funding and they have a limited number of patients to recruit. So the research coming out isn't particularly great. Uh, and given the lack of this, uh, of a big, robust kind of evidence base, most doctors tend to be unwilling to try out new medications, uh, which may, through small studies, have been shown to be beneficial for patients with POTS, which is terrible because uh, as doctors are reluctant to try out new medications because there's no big evidence base, we don't develop any experience, and therefore the treatment of the patient remains stagnant, and therefore we don't build an evidence base. It therefore becomes really important for patients with POTS to become as informed as possible and to become their own advocates. And I was hoping, in view of this, to talk to you about a medication which has been shown through small research studies and which I have used myself, which seems to help some patients with POTS, uh, which is not being prescribed. This medication is called pyridostigmine. It is also known as Mestinon, M-E-S-T-I-O-N-O-N. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the science behind Mestinon, and then I'm going to talk to you about the evidence. Okay. So in POTS and dysautonomia, there is no doubt that there's an imbalance between our flight or fright response and our rest and digest response. And in general, there is an exaggerated uh, flight or fright response. Okay, So there's an exaggerated um, response to adrenaline. And this is why patients with POTS will find that their heart rate goes up excessively. They're always kind of wired, you know, they don't sleep, they don't get any, they don't uh, rest well, they don't digest well, they're always on edge, their heart rate's always shooting up, uh, etc. Uh, so in patients with a dysautonomia or POTS, you have an exaggerated flight or fright response. And most of the medications that have been used, like beta blockers and ibobradin, are designed to damp down or blunt this exaggerated flight or fright response, and they seem to work reasonably well. However, it is possible that if we exaggerated the rest and digest response, uh, so rather than just aiming to blunt the flight or fright, if we can in some way exaggerate the rest and digest response, we could achieve the same result in a different way. And in so doing, it offers us a, a different therapeutic target. And I guess if you can combine the two, so you blunt one side down and you increase the other side, that would work even better. Uh, so the rest and digest system is largely driven by a uh, neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. Okay? Uh, the flight or fright is driven by adrenaline and noradrenaline. The rest and digest is driven by acetylcholine. Um, now, acetylcholine tends to be broken down by an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase. If in some way we could stop this acetylcholinesterase from breaking down the acetylcholine, it means that there's more acetylcholine within the body, which means our rest and digest responses would predominate and potentially counteract the flight or fright responses brought on by the POTS. Pyridostigmine is a medication which is an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. It inhibits the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. By doing so, it increases the amount of acetylcholine, and this, in theory, should increase our rest and digest responses. So given that, it offers a new therapeutic target for patients with POTS. <coughs> the next question is, even though in theory it's, uh, it sounds like a good idea, 
does it work? There was a paper published as early as 2005 in a journal called Circulation, and the authors were Raj, R-A-J, Satish Raj is the author. Satish Raj is pretty well much the guy who does everything with POPs, so if you're ever looking for research, Satish Raj is the man. Anyway, he published a paper called Acetylcholinesterase Inhibition Improves Tachycardia in Postural Tachycardia Syndrome, where what these guys did was they compared the effects of giving 17 patients who had POTS either pyridostigmine at a dose of 30 milligrams daily or placebo in a randomized crossover study. And so what they were really interested in finding out is what happens to the blood pressure of the patient, the heart rate of the patient, and symptoms when the patient is seated, and then when the patient has been standing for 10 minutes at two hours after taking the medication and at four hours taking the medication. Remember, for a lot of patients, when they stand up, they feel very unsettled, the heart rate goes up, they feel they have all sorts of symptoms, and I'll talk about the symptoms that they tested for. Uh, so they were interested in knowing what happens to this objectively. Okay? Uh, the, in terms of symptoms, they asked about nine particular symptoms, which a lot of patients with POTS will complain of. Uh, mental clouding, blurred vision, shortness of breath, a rapid heart rate, tremulouslessness, chest discomfort, headache, lightheadedness, and nausea. So they were interested in knowing about these nine symptoms and they were interested in seeing what happens to the heart rate. So when you look at patients with POTS, particularly in this study, at baseline, when they were, uh, they, when they were just lying down, uh, their average heart rate was about 75 beats per minute. When these people got up, uh, their average heart rate went up by almost 50 beats a minute to 124 beats per minute. So th this is what happens in POTS. Your heart rate is 75. When you're lying down, you suddenly you stand up and your heart rate would shoot up. And in this study, it shows up to 50 beats per minute. Their blood pressure was 112, 70 average. And when these guys stood up again, the blood pressure went up, not as much as the heart rate. The blood pressure went up to 127 over 77, the average again. They also measured the adrenaline and noradrenaline levels in the blood. And again, they found that the levels were okay when the patient was lying down. But when the patient stands up, these levels go up. Again, in keeping with what I've told you, an increased sympathetic surge, increased adrenaline levels, that exaggerated response to adrenaline. Um, then they were interested in saying, well, what happens if we give these patients either placebo or this pyridostigmine, leave them two hours and get them to stand up, do we see a difference? And what they found is that in those people who had the pyridostigmine, the average heart rate on standing had fallen to 100 beats per minute, whereas those who were on placebo had only gone down to 110 beats per minute. So significant drop in heart rate at two hours after taking the medication. Uh, they found that uh, at four hours, the heart rate in the patients who had the pyridostigmine would only go up to 104 beats per minute, whereas in those people who had placebo, it was still going at 109 beats per minute. In terms of blood pressure, what they found was that the blood pressure um, would not go up as high in the pyridostigmine. So from an average of 119, uh, the blood pressure fell to 117 in patients with pyridostigmine, but actually rose to 122 on placebo. So not huge differences, but it tells you that the pyridostigmine didn't increase the blood pressure, but the placebo did. Uh, and that's probably because pyridostigmine blunts the heart rate, and some of the blood pressure is dependent on the heart rate, and that's why. In terms of symptoms, patients definitely said that they had less symptoms, those nine symptoms, they had less uh, symptoms on the pyridostigmine compared to the placebo. So in the conclusion of this very small study was that pyridostigmine could benefit some patients with POTS. When I read this study, I thought, well, you know, okay, there's not a huge database, but there isn't for POTS, so why don't I try it in some of my patients and see how it goes? Uh, and I have actually found in my own experience that a lot of patients seem to tolerate pyridostigmine quite well, and they actually do feel a bit better on it. And therefore, not everyone, but I think it's quite nice to try it on everyone, and those who don't, well, they've tried it, and those who do, well, there's the gain to be had there. Um, I tend to use it in doses of 30 milligrams twice a day, and then if the patient is able to tolerate it, I increase the dose to 30 milligrams three times a day, and then I can increase it even further to 60 milligrams three times a day. I tend to use it with people who take ibobradin as well. So that wouldn't stop me from using it. Um, 
I tend to avoid using it in asthma. Uh, and I've also found that this medication increases gastric motility. So in those patients, uh, some patients with POTS are always constipated. You know, they get a lot of bloating. They, don't, they have great difficulty passing food out. Um, this is because of the gastroparesis that is seen in dysautonomias. And in those patients, they actually get better with the POTS. You know, those symptoms get better because with the pyridostigmine because the gastric motility improves. However, there are other patients who have dysautonomia who tend to predominantly get diarrhea. And in those people, I don't tend to use it as often because uh, I worry that it will cause abdominal cramps. In terms of other side effects, um, other side effects include nausea, muscle twitching, headaches, breathlessness. But as I say, in my experience, most people seem to tolerate reasonably well. Uh, I think it's certainly worth trying when, you know, particularly when a person is really struggling and they're trying everything and nothing's working. It's certainly worth trying. Obviously, before trying out any medication, my advice is always that you should seek the advice of your local doctor who will undoubtedly know you a lot better than me. But giving them this kind of evidence and saying, okay, you know, I haven't, I know it's not got thousands and thousands of papers patients that have been tested with this medication but in this small study some benefited so how do we know that I wouldn't be one of those who could have benefited so why not try it. Um, other than that thank you so much for watching uh, I, I hope you found this useful I'll try and put out some more videos on POTS and medications that help for POTS so that you can be your best advocate. Uh, once again thank you so much if you think there's anyone who will benefit from this please consider sharing the video I'd be so so grateful. And also, I'd be so grateful if you'd consider uh, subscribing to the YouTube channel, Your Cardiology. Thank you so much. All the best.